Before talking about the dinosaurs, um, I uh, go through a diversity of other archosaur uh, reptile groups, which would include uh, crocodiles, pterosaurs, and uh, others. Uh, the very first reptiles are known from the beginning of the Carboniferous period. Diapsid reptiles, those which had two temporal openings for jaw muscles, are known from the mid Carboniferous period. And then by the Permian, um, uh, these primitive diapsids have been uh, diverged into two groups of uh, diapsid, which uh, include the lepidosaurs, this would include the lizards and uh, snakes, um, but then are also the archosaurs. Now, the word archosaur has arch in it, so an arch enemy, that's just not any old enemy, that's a serious enemy. An archbishop is not any old bishop. Arch means to rule, so archosaurs literally mean the ruling reptiles. Now, certainly the dinosaurs. Uh, would rule in a sense, you know, they were the dominant meat eaters and plant eaters in terrestrial environments. Um, but there were other archosaurs uh, as, uh, as well. And so this video, I'd like to kind of overview uh, their uh, diversity. They would include the first vertebrates to fly, the pterosaurs, and then also the second pterosaurs, to, uh, the second uh, vertebrates to fly, the birds, uh, which would be descended from dinosaurs. They would also include uh, crocodiles, um, they would include uh, diverse uh, dinosaurs and certainly many uh, other uh, groups. And so um, I'd like to go through these uh, archosaurs. Now, one of the, the, the great things that uh, we observe is the gradual evolution of you know, these uh, reptilian uh, groups, and that would include uh, archosaurs. So um, there have not always been crocos uh, crocodiles, pterosaurs, birds, dinosaurs, etc. And long before that were uh, the first of these ruling uh, reptiles. Now, like all biological groups, uh, we need to identify, uh, you know, the traits. And so there would be features of the skull and the limb bones, etc. that one could use to identify, you know, this group uh, is what we're going to call an archosaur um, you know, and this animal isn't. Um, prior to there being archosaurs, uh, there were archosaur amorphs, right? And so, um, you know, here we have a number of uh, more primitive forms. Notice uh, uh, many or all of them from the early to mid uh, Triassic period. Uh, so there would be, uh, as we transition from uh, basal diapsid uh, reptiles into uh, archosaur uh, amorphs into archosaurs. And if you look at the changes in the skull, all the bones are the same. So these are related. They have uh, similar um, uh, uh, skull uh, bones, which simply then get modified as we go from the, you know, the late Permian animals uh, to the early uh, Triassic uh, animals, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, uh, at first, these archosaurs would uh, can, uh, include many smaller forms, including some forms which were rather lightly built and then even bipedal. Now, perhaps the most famous archosaurs, in addition to the big dinosaurs, would be, you know, big crocodiles and big rauwasukians. Um, but there were uh, many smaller uh, forms which would be capable of at least some bipedal uh, lo uh, locomotion. And so here we see, you know, a couple you know, which would have been uh, more lightly built. Um, and as we will see, uh, the earliest dinosaurs were bipedal, the earliest crocodiles had some, um, you know, uh, bipedal uh, capabilities. And so uh, a lot of these uh, archosaurs at first were not, you know, these huge dominant reptiles, although these may be the more uh, famous ones. Some were three feet long, six feet long, uh, et cetera. Notice this one had, you know, some, uh, adaptations for aquatic uh, life uh, 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 in its uh, flipper modifications, um, uh, et cetera. Um, U Park area is an interesting uh, archosaur um, because uh, it is close to uh, the ancestry for both crocodiles and then later groups like uh, dinosaurs. And so if you start to look at uh, the archosaurs, um, you know, it's a family tree where branches go off at various times. And then in the early Triassic, you still had some archosaurs which would be um, in the lineage of multiple later 
uh, groups. Uh, so uh, some of these would get to be, you know, large quadrupedal uh, animals. Um, so notice, you know, uh, this one's 12 feet long, this one's six feet long, uh, et cetera. So there were some, you know, very large uh, archosaurs. Um, but uh, some, like Euparkeria, uh, were much uh, smaller and would be capable of at least some bipedal locomotion. Um, the interesting thing about uh, Euparkeria uh, is uh, as we look at its skull, we'll see additional modifications uh, such as the development of uh, an opening in front of the eye known as the antorbital fenestra. Um, now, this would be something that the early crocodiles would have, the later crocodiles would lose it, but the pterosaurs would have, the dinosaurs would have. And so here we're looking at a, um, a skull, which could then be modified into the skulls of both early crocodiles and early dinosaurs without too much modification. All of the bones are there in about the right uh, places. So Euparkeria may be three feet long, uh, capable of um, at least some bipedal uh, locomotion. This was then uh, the ancestor of, um, uh, of many of the, uh, uh, of the archosaur groups uh, which would follow. Uh, I'll get back to crocodiles. Um, this next uh, group lived in the Triassic period. The Triassic period was a great period for lots of archosaur um, reptile uh, groups. Many of them would die at the end of the, uh, of the Triassic period. And so uh, the Triassic period is between two mass extinctions. So the archosaurs survived the mass extinction at the end of the Permian, and then they became quite successful in uh, the aftermath, you know, perhaps because some of their um, competition, like you know, those big synapsid reptiles, you know, the mammal-like ones, you know, in the Permian, you know, many of the largest, most dominant reptiles were not of the the diapsid kin, but rather of the synapsid kin related to mammals. Um, but then, um, as after uh, the end Permian extinction, uh, they are uh, they are gone, and so these archosaurs. You know, perhaps one of the things contributing to their success is the loss of the competition uh, that these extinct ones had produced. And so then if you look, uh, so obviously here are, you know, some which are you know, maybe uh, seven, eight feet long, 12 feet long, more than 30 feet long. And so these are phytosaurs. Uh, these phytosaurs kind of look like crocodiles, at least in their body form. They were, you know, probably spending time around aquatic environments, um, but they aren't crocodiles. It is another group of, um, uh, of uh, archosaurs uh, entirely. And one of the most significant things is if you look there at the purple opening, um, the opening for the nostrils migrated back in the skull. So here there are two openings depicted on these skulls, the blue opening for the orbit, for the eye, and then also the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the purple opening for the nostril. Um, this was probably an advantage because it meant that, you know, for example, if you've ever seen a crocodile, or I'm sorry, an alligator see, swimming in the water, it swims and tries to sneak up on its prey, um, but its snout is above the water, exposing both the eyes and the nostrils. Um, but an alligator's head's big, and so you know some animals might notice it uh, coming. If the nostrils were very close to the eyes, then that means that the uh, animal could uh, have most of its head submerged and just hold above, you know, that portion which had both the eyes and the nostrils. This would argue, arguably, make it harder to observe, uh, and thus be an adaptation for. Um, for sneaking up on prey. So phytosaurs look like crocodiles, um, but once again, uh, their nostrils are not here at the tip of their snout, um, but were here instead. Uh, and this was you know, a, a large group of diverse reptiles, some getting more than 30 feet long, but once again, only known in the Triassic period. There was a mass extinction at the end of the Triassic period, and the phytosaurs, which had been dominant during uh, the Triassic period, they do not survive that mass extinction. Um, there were other groups of, um, 
of archosaurs in the uh, Triassic. So there were uh, herbivores which had bony armor, the adasaurs. Um, uh, so, you know, they had uh, bony armor. They look like armored dinosaurs in many ways. Uh, uh, but they uh, become extinct at the end of the Triassic period. Um, here we see some middle Triassic forms. Notice that they're big, six feet long and nine feet long. Um, but then from these later come even um, bigger uh, 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 groups, uh, the Rauwasukians. Um, so when we think of reptiles in the Triassic period, I know, you know we would often think of, say, the dinosaurs. You know, this was the age of the dinosaurs. While dinosaurs certainly were successful in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, um, um, uh, in the Triassic, they had company, all right? And so here were some six and nine feet long forms, and then there were uh, longer forms as well. Um, and so uh, these Rauwasukians, uh, some of which could be 20 feet long, um, these were large dominant archosaurs, apex predators in the Triassic. So the dinosaurs, they really come to into their own after the end Triassic extinction, which includes these uh, Rauwasukians. So then, um, you know, among all of the things that dinosaurs had about them, which made them successful, one needs to consider, was it also then the loss of some of their uh, competitors, uh, which contributed uh, to, uh, uh, to their success as well? So once again, the Triassic period, um, after the end Permian extinction, but preceding the extinction at the end of uh, the Triassic period, when Pangaea started to break up and the Atlantic Ocean started to form. Uh, many many archosaur groups uh, evolved during uh, this time, but some of which did not survive until uh, after the um, it did not survive that end uh, that end Triassic extinction. Although there were some uh, archosaur groups which did not survive the end Triassic extinction such as the Adasaurs, the Phytosaurs, the Rauwasukians, and others. Um, there were some that did. Uh, the dinosaurs, which would uh, then lead to birds, um, and then also the crocodiles. So crocodiles and birds are the closest living relatives of each other today, um, given that they are both uh, archosaurs. Um, the very first crocodiles uh, evolved in the Triassic uh, period. Um, and so the Paleozoic era, which includes, you know, uh, 250 you know, million years, 300 million years of vertebrate history, and, you know, 100 million years of reptile history, there are zero crocodiles known from the Paleozoic. Um, the first crocodiles are known from the Triassic period of the Mesozoic, um, but uh, they are, um, uh, most of them, uh, small uh, individuals. Uh, some were a foot uh, long, a foot and a half, three feet long. Um, and so here we see, you know, a few which were 30 centimeters. So when crocodiles first appear, they aren't the crocodiles of today. They're not closely related to the crocodiles of today. Um, and many were smaller forms which still had that light build typical of many of the, um, uh, of the early uh, uh, dinosaur morphs and early archosaurs. So when we uh, look at the archosaurs of the Triassic, these include Sphenosuchian crocodiles. Um, there are you know, a couple big groups of crocodiles. Um, here's the earliest uh, uh, group. Um, the later Mesozoic would have the Mesosuchians, and then it's the Eusuchians who are alive today. So while these are crocodiles, they are not the crocodiles of today. And notice that, you know, there are some which are three feet long, maybe four feet long, uh, but some about a foot and a half long, et cetera. And many of them would have been either, you know, bipedal or at least capable of bipedal locomotion. So they were not uh, the large, stout, robust um, uh, uh, forms of uh, today. Uh, but once again, you know, they would have uh, been smaller, more lightly built, and their body shapes would have um, allowed, in, for example, in this uh, case, uh, both uh, bipedal and uh, quadrupedal uh, locomotion. Uh, here you look at Terrestrosuchus with its very thin limbs, obviously unlike any 
at a crocodilian um, uh, today. Um, now, in addition to you know being capable in some cases of bipedal locomotion, notice that they would have held their bodies off the ground, what um, we would call erect. So uh, lizards sprawl, you know, their bellies can drag on the ground. Whereas you look at say a dog or a horse, um, their uh, bellies are off uh, the ground. It takes more energy to do that, um, but then you can achieve you know, greater speeds. Uh, so these early crocodiles were, um, uh, their posture was uh, erect rather than lizard-like. Uh, and so when we think of the first dinosaurs, the same, you know, they were, you know, erect walking, not lizards which sprawl. Uh, this is not unlike modern crocodiles in a sense, in that while crocodiles do spend a great deal of time, um, you know, uh, just uh, lying and, and, and sprawling, it's very energy efficient. They are capable of holding their bellies off the ground and moving, and they are capable of moving much faster than what many people appreciate. And so, you know, anyone would advise you if you see an alligator, you know, don't be reckless enough where you think you're fast and the alligator is the sprawling reptile that's rather slow. Some people have, um, you know, uh, come too close to an alligator only to realize that it is capable of far faster movement than they thought. And they could obviously get into trouble in this way. So here's another um, three foot long crocodile. Notice that its posture probably, you know, held its body off. Um, off the ground. So in the Triassic period, we get the first crocodilians, but they are the Sphenosupian crocodilians, very unlike the, uh, the crocodiles of today. There's a mass extinction uh, at the end of the Triassic. And then in the aftermath, then a new group of uh, crocodiles, the Mesosupians, uh, becomes uh, dominant. So these mesosupians, this is actually the greatest diversity that the crocodiles uh, achieve, all right? And so um, uh, crocodile lineages come in waves. Uh, there's, you know, the earliest crocodiles from uh, the uh, Triassic period. Once again, there's a mass extinction at the end of the Triassic period. But then as we get into the Jurassic period, um, there are all of these diverse crocodilians. So some of them were, um, you know, uh, certainly 30 and maybe 40 feet long. Now, as such, when we think of the age of dinosaurs, you know, when we think of predators like Tyrannosaurus rex, which are dominant terrestrial predators, but there were crocodiles, which were about as big. Now, once again, if we were to talk about size in this case, you, know, you might find dinosaurs which were longer, but since these crocodilians were supporting their weight in the body uh, in water, then they could actually be thicker and heavier. So if you were to ask who were the dominant predators, you know, during uh, the Mesozoic, the answer might not be things like, you know, Tyrannosaurus, you know, Rex, um, was certainly very big, but actually, you know, some of these uh, crocodilians might actually have been heavier so they would have, you know, we often don't mention them as dominant, you know, predators in the Mesozoic, but they were. Um, some of these Mesozoic lineages included marine uh, crocodiles, which then would have uh, been predators in uh, the open uh, ocean. They were quite diverse. So today we think of the gharials, which have the elongated uh, snouts, which are an adaptation uh, for trapping uh, fish. Um, but this has evolved separately. So here you can see two Yusukians, uh, which have evolved a narrow snout to help them catch fish. But there were Mesosukians, which did uh, the same. So that uh, trait has actually evolved uh, multiple times in, uh, in unrelated uh, lineages. And so um, the Mesozoic era had this great diversity of these Mesosukian uh, crocodilians, uh, which were diverse, uh, you know, from marine uh, animals to uh, great terrestrial predators. From these uh, Mesosuchians evolved a new group um, by the middle of the Cretaceous period known as the Eusuchians, and is the Eusuchians which are alive today. And so thus it should be noted that um, uh, crocodiles uh, first evolved in the Mesozoic. There are zero in the Paleozoic, 
but they evolved in waves. So Spinosuchians and the Triassic Mesosuchians dominated in uh, much of the Mesozoic, but only the Eusuchians, which arose in the Cretaceous, have survived until uh, uh, today. And so um, from uh, these uh, uh, mid uh, Cretaceous uh, Eusuchians, then there are some uh, separation of uh, lineages. Uh, there was a, a diversity of fossil forms. So um, uh, this one here uh, lived in uh, the Amazon in the Cenozoic. Now in the Cenozoic, there were not only giant rodents like today, the, um, so uh, today there are, I'm sorry, I don't know where the picture went. Uh, uh, today there are uh, rodents the size of pigs, the carpincho or capybara. Um, but uh, this carpincho had um, fossil relatives, which could get to be much bigger, the size of small cows. And in that environment in the Amazon, not only did you have rodents the size of small cows, um, but you also then had reptiles which fed on them. There were um, uh, boas, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an anaconda relative, uh, which uh, could get to be almost 50 feet long. And then uh, this crocodilian, it's a Yusukian, could get to be 40 feet uh, long and eight feet tall at uh, the shoulder. And so, uh, you know, the Yusukians include many fossil forms which are not alive uh, uh, today, but then also then in include the crocodilians which are. And so uh, the Yusukians diversified into a number of, uh, of uh, lineages, as some of them, um, by the late Cretaceous fossils in all of the three modern superfamilies. So today we, we put our, um, our crocodilians, as so the American crocodile, for example, would be in this uh, superfamily, the alligator would, I mean, caimans would be in this superfamily, and the gharial would be in uh, this superfamily. And then by the end of the Cretaceous, the Yusukian family tree had diverged uh, to the point where uh, the uh, fossil ancestors of all of these um, existed. Uh, now, once again, um, there was diversity in the fossil members. Uh, some of them actually, once again, separately evolved this. You know, they were sometimes called the duck-billed uh, crocodilians. They weren't related, um, uh, but uh, that uh, they had a much longer snout. Now, no one knows this, but you know, wonders like, did they just sit with their mouth open, you know, very still? Uh, so that perhaps a uh, like a small uh, you know animal might you know uh, disregard you know this this large animal and it could snap its mouth shut um, uh, quickly you know that is uh, in, that's unknown uh, and so from those late Cretaceous uh, branchings then uh, three groups have survived until today I have uh, them uh, here. Uh, the, uh, the ranges of each of those. Um, tragically, there are endangered uh, members in all of the, uh, the super families. And so um, and just two points when we consider the diversity of the life on earth today, it's useful then to consider its, you know, its history. And you can see once again, these are branches of a family tree. And you know, one can follow then you know, this branch you know, and uh, that branch, et cetera. Um, but just ha like things have gone extinct in uh, the past, uh, many of these uh, species are then only known from very narrow ranges uh, today and as the human population uh, expands uh, and then um, and requires uh, more land, uh, you know, for uh, farms, for cow pasture, for cities, for roads, etc. As wetlands are drained, uh, this is certainly affecting uh, the habitat of these animals. And then some animals, such as crocodilians, can then also be uh, hunted for meat, uh, for their hides, etc. And so we are certainly uh, concerned about uh, the uh, modern crocodilians uh, because uh, there are uh, endangered species whose populations uh, are uh, dwindling. And so I give uh, just some examples of that in each of the three groups of crocodiles alive today. Uh, so uh, the alligators with their wider snouts, uh, the crocodilians uh, with their, uh, na uh, you know, their more pointed snouts, and then the uh, gharial and false gharial, which have 
a very narrow snout as an adaptation uh, for, um, uh, for hunting uh, uh, fish. And once again, there's you know a different um, uh, a species in each. Uh, so you know the, the Cuban crocodile, for example, uh, is, is found only uh, in uh, in Cuba. Uh, and so I give some examples there. And then just finally, as we go uh, forward before leaving crocodilians, I'd like to point out just how significantly they vary, because very often you know at some point we ask you know could this animal evolve into this animal? Uh, well. One of the ways of perhaps uh, you know, wrapping our minds around that is to ask, well, crocodiles are related to uh, each other. Um, so to what degree do some crocodiles vary from others? And when one considers, say, the, the skull differences, for example, uh, from one crocodile to another, um, it's far greater the variation that you can see within crocodilians that, that, for example, would separate a dinosaur morph from a dinosaur. All right. And so you know, there were some which had narrow snouts, some which had um, wide snouts. If you look at the um, uh, the bone and the extension of each bone, they were very, very um, uh, sort of a secondary palate uh, uh, to help them breathe underwater. And so there's certainly a great deal uh, of variation in, uh, uh, in crocodilians. Final group, uh, the final group of um, archosaurs uh, I'd like to discuss are the pterosaurs. Uh, now, obviously, this omits the dinosaurs, but then that will be, you know, the, the upcoming uh, lectures. So uh, the archosaurs, uh, after the end Permian extinction, diversified to a great deal in the Triassic period. This is when we get the first crocodiles, the, uh, a number of extinct groups. Um, but then we also get the uh, pterosaurs. The pterosaurs were the first group of vertebrates to fly. There are three main groups of vertebrates uh, which fly. Now, just to, to clarify, a number of groups can glide. I mean, there are some frogs which can leap from a tree and they have webbing between their fingers. There are some snakes which can launch from a tree and flatten their bodies and glide a little bit. There are some lizards which can glide. We know of fossil reptiles uh, which uh, could uh, glide. Uh, there are squirrels and uh, marsupials uh, which can uh, glide. So there are a number of gliding vertebrates. Um, there might have been some uh, groups which were capable of some degree of flight. So some theropod dinosaurs could fly. So uh, uh, Rahona or Rahonavis, um, Microraptor. Uh, there were a number of theropod dinosaurs which had flight feathers on their arms, some on their arms and legs that could arguably uh, fly a little bit. But there were three major groups of vertebrates which evolved the ability to fly. Um, bats would come last. They would be limited to the Cenozoic uh, era. Birds would be the second group, starting in the Jurassic period, descending from feathered, uh, you know, perhaps even flying dinosaurs. Um, but pterosaurs were the first. So pterosaurs were the first group of vertebrates to fly. Now, to explain how they manage the ability to fly, just I'd like to compare the bones in the limbs of, say, uh, you know, a normal reptile, a basal reptile, a human on the other side, and a pterosaur. And you'll notice that a lot of the bones are the same. The forearm has a radius and an ulna. There are carpal bones, although the uh, pterosaurs, they did have a, a unique carpal bone, which allowed them to have a wing membrane go from their wrist to their, uh, to their neck. Um, they had carpal bones, and then they have digits. They have digits one, two, and three. So far, nothing exciting. Um, they all have a digit five, although you might notice that in the pterosaur, digit five is just a splint of a bone. It's not uh, significant at all. Um, but uh, if it seems like I've omitted something, I have. I've omitted digit four. So here's digit four on a reptile. Here's digit four on uh, a human. Um, digit four on a pterosaur didn't just include this metacarpal here, but also then phalanges. Um, but then the phalanges were much elongated. And so when you look at a pterosaur, it has essentially the same bones in its hand as you do, uh, with the exception that the fourth digit was greatly uh, elongated and thus supported a membrane which would then stretch from the tip of this digit uh, to uh, the side of the body and then allow 
uh, flight. So pterosaurs evolved the ability to, flight, uh, to fly by lengthening the fourth digit and then by having a, um, a membrane uh, you know, then extend uh, to uh, the body. Now, um, it is not known with clarity, you know, the stages in which uh, that uh, modification uh, evolved. Um, there are a number of reptiles known uh, from the Triassic where the fourth finger was the longest. So, you know, presumably that is how this evolved that from a basal reptile, which had a fourth finger, that you then had forms where the fourth finger got to be bigger and bigger. Uh, one of the problems is if you're dealing with small reptiles, sometimes incompletely uh, known, um, then the, uh, you know, how they relate to each other could, you know, be, uh, had some disagreement. And so some authors would put, you know, these two together in a group, some would uh, separate them a bit more. And so rather than, you know, wade into that, because, you know, uh, a new discovery next year might change that. I'd simply like to point out that uh, um, arguably a transitional form in the evolution of pterosaurs would then be reptiles, which were small, um, uh, maybe even, uh, you know, adapted for life in uh, the trees. Uh, which had lengthened fourth fingers, and the Triassic certainly did have some of those. There are reptiles known where the fourth finger was the longest um, uh, uh, finger, uh, one of which even then had lengthened scales, uh, which some have likened to feathers or proto feathers. Uh, you know, uh, uh, seeming uh, in its name Longisquama literally means long scale. Um, uh, uh, for you know some sort of adaptation for life in the trees, maybe gliding, etc. So once again, I prefer not to get into you know this one led to that one because uh, the systematics of this you know is still under some debate. But there were small reptiles, uh, some apparently adapted for life in the trees, uh, with uh, lengthened fourth digits, and you know arguably it is an animal like that that would have led then led to the pterosaurs. When we look at the pterosaurs, there are two groups. There are certainly the pterodactyls, they, the large ones. You know, some of their wingspans could approach 40 feet in uh, length. Uh, many were toothless. Um, and these would then dominate in the uh, second half of the Mesozoic era, so in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. At the end of the age of dinosaurs, at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, these were the only ones which were left, these uh, larger ones. Uh, but it was the rampharynchoid uh, pterosaurs which were the first pterosaurs. So not all pterosaurs coexisted, and the smaller uh, rampharynchoid uh, pterosaurs existed uh, before the large uh, pterodactyl, um, uh, the, the large pterodactyl uh, pterosaurs. Um, of the early uh, pterosaurs going back to uh, the Triassic. Um, some early ones are known which had shorter wings. And so uh, there are a couple uh, which are known whose wings were shorter and then what would uh, uh, appear later. And so then arguably this, you know, uh, is potentially a, a transitional form uh, of those uh, later ones. Uh, the rampharynchoid ones tended to have long tails. The pterodactyls often lost their tails. Uh, the rampharynchoid ones had, had teeth. Many of the, uh, the, ter uh, the pterodactyls uh, lacked uh, uh, teeth. And so uh, we have these two groups of pterosaurs that probably differed in their flying. The rampharynchoid um, uh, pterosaurs being smaller probably flew by flapping their wings, uh, whereas the pterosaurs, especially you know, those which uh, achieved considerable size, they probably would have depended primarily on soaring. So if you were to watch you know, eagles or vultures you know, today, very often they're soaring on uh, the rising currents of air. It's a very efficient way to move, um, while birds closer to the ground you know, fly by flapping their wings. The rampharynchoid uh, pterosaurs uh, were smaller and probably would have flown by flapping their wings, uh, while the, the larger uh, pterodactyls would have depended more on, uh, on soaring. 
uh, you know, fascinating the study of pterosaurs. This is just kind of a quick overview. They they did have large brains for reptiles, uh, and so um, you know whether it be you know the senses or the cerebellum, which uh, probably would have uh, been important for the coordination of uh, flight uh, muscles. Uh, you know they uh, had adaptations uh, there. At least uh, a few of them seem to have had modified fluffy scales. So there seems to be like a hair-like coat uh, around them. Now, since we see this in some of the ter uh, the, uh, the theropod dinosaurs, then you could ask you know the question. So Pteranodon, for example, which has this you know fluffy coat around it. Is this something that evolved separately? So did multiple lineages uh, develop uh, scales which just got longer and frayed at the ends? Or does this go back to the early archosaurs and then was inherited uh, by both the pterosaurs and the theropod dinosaurs from a common uh, ancestor? Uh, and so um, uh, here uh, you see a larger uh, a uh, pterodactyl, once again, uh, it's, you know, large size. There were some with 20-foot wingspans, 40-foot uh, wingspans. Uh, this probably would have required them uh, to, uh, to soar on currents of air. Now, while these were not the first pterosaurs, uh, they were the last ones. Um, the smaller pterosaurs, uh, they became uh, extinct. Uh, and what I'm about to say, it's conjecture. But they, you know, dwindled at the time that the birds were spreading. Now, once again, this is more in the conjecture, but a bird's wing is shorter and it's covered by protective feathers, while these wings, they're longer and it's a skin membrane. And uh, I'm just imagining, I can think of disadvantages of a skin membrane. I can imagine that it's a lot easier for, say, biting insects you know, to, to really plague something with this long um, a skin uh, membrane, uh, as opposed to, um, a, you know, a, a shorter uh, wing, which is covered by uh, feathers, which offer some protection. Also, uh, for example, you know, if one were to say run through the woods, or right, one has to be careful because branches, you know, can scratch your face. Um, if you were going to try to fly through the woods with all of these branches, uh, a thin skin membrane uh, is potentially uh, more easily damaged than shorter wings covered with protective uh, feathers. So it is possible that it was competition from birds that could more easily, say, fly in, uh, you know, wooded areas. Uh, that is the reason that the smaller pterodactyl, uh, the smart, I'm sorry, the smaller rampharynchoids dwindled, um, and then uh, the pterosaurs, uh, their most lasting uh, lineages uh, were then uh, the big ones, which would now be near the coast, uh, you know, soaring and fishing rather than flying in uh, forested uh, areas. Many of the pterosaurs were clearly feeding on fish. They have these narrow bills with very fine teeth, uh, which um, are, you know, would give them adapt uh, an adaptation for uh, trying to, you know, snap up, you know, slippery fish um, uh, quickly. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there was variation in the skull and I'll get to an image, uh, presently. Um, and just the great advantage of this is that, um, insects are old and winged insects, you know, go back to the Paleozoic. And for a hundred million years, no one could eat them once they started to fly. Um, so, you know, once they took to the air, they were essentially on base. Um, but in the mid-Triassic, these pterosaurs now, they had a food source that no other, you know, animal had been able to take advantage of. They were the first, you know, group to fly. So that would have been a great advantage. Obviously, there's lots of fish in the world, and as many birds practice today, if you can fly over a body of water, you can grab dead fish, and you can snatch, you know, living fish from the water, you know, certainly eagles and kingfishers and ospreys and, you know, diverse, uh, you know, birds do that today. But then before there were birds, then uh, these, um, and these pterosaurs evolved the ability to do that. And so clearly flight had great advantages um, in that now there were, you know, fish which could be hunted from uh, above and insects, which, you know, flying insects, no other, you know, vertebrate was actually very good at preying on them until 
the uh, pterosaurs. So pterosaurs, the first flying vertebrates, were quite successful um, in uh, you know, the Triassic and, and the remainder of the Mesozoic, their success would only then be limited uh, by, you know, the spread of birds, the second group of uh, flying, um, of flying vertebrates. Now, just to point out before getting to uh, dinosaurs, uh, let's hear some. Um, so if we were to look at the family tree, which would lead to dinosaurs, the first reptiles evolved in the Carboniferous. This gave way to diapsids. This gave way uh, from the diapsids evolved archosauriforms, almost archosaurs, but not quite, and then true archosaurs. And then the archosaurs would give rise to, you know, things like Euparkeria, um, to crocodiles, to adosaurs, to phytosaurs, to Rauasuchians, etc. Um, and then there is a clade known as uh, the Ornithodirons. Uh, this would then include the archosaurs after the crocodile lineage diverged. And so these are obviously crocodiles, they are archosaurs. Um, so Euparkeria, you know, could have been, you know, similar to the ancestral form of both crocodiles and then this lineage, which includes pterosaurs and dinosaurs. So there was archosaurs include all of these, but then within the archosaurs, there would have been, been this group of ornithodira, uh, which would include dinosaurs, their descendants, the birds, and pterosaurs, but exclude crocodiles. So pterosaurs are more closely related to um, dinosaurs than uh, would be uh, the crocodiles. And there is, you know, some fossil evidence. So for example, scleromoclus, which appears here at the end, uh, this is um, a small bipedal, lightly built animal, um, which is thought to be uh, an ornithodiron. Uh, so uh, the pterosaurs are thought to have evolved from these small, lightly built ornithodirons, once again, the cousins of the dinosaur lineage. So dinosaurs and pterosaurs form this group, um, which uh, are, that are more closely related to each other than uh, the crocodilians here are. Finally, just to, to recap and to review some images, some from museums, some of uh, drawings. Um, so here is a Triassic reptile. Um, it you know might look dinosaur-like, but it's not. This is one of those Rauasuchians, so it's a dominant archosaur. Uh, so the dinosaurs had company in the Triassic, and the archosaurs had many. Uh, lineages. Uh, Longisquama, um, uh, I had uh, mentioned, uh, its name comes from these long scales, uh, which uh, some have interpreted to be uh, feather-like. Uh, the phytosaurs, as I had pointed out, their nostrils are uh, very high on their skulls. So when you go to a museum, you know, the eye sockets are there, the nostrils are there. All right, so notice if the eye sockets and nostrils are you know, so close together, uh, the animals would not have had to have had, you know, much of their skull above, uh, above the water, and, and that would have allowed them to, uh, uh, you know, to sneak up on, uh, on things. Uh, the adosaurs, they were thought to be herbivores, uh, which had a, a great deal of, uh, of armor in their skin, dermal bone. Um, but even crocodiles have dermal bone, so they have uh, bones uh, known as osteoderms, which give them, you know, very thick uh, hides. And I had gone through uh, these uh, fossil uh, uh, crocodiles. Um, on the uh, pterosaurs, once again, Scleromoclus is an ornithodiron. And so um, uh, it was animals like this, which were in the group, which included both the pterosaurs and uh, the uh, dinosaurs. Uh, and when one considers uh, the pterosaurs, uh, one of the things that impresses me is just the great diversity of their skulls. All right, so we know that uh, pterosaurs are uh, related to uh, each other. Um, now they would include the small forms, they would include, say, Pteranodon with a 20 foot wingspan and this prominent crest, also had you know, some hair like or proto feather covering over its body. Uh, Ornithochirus and Quetzalcoatlus, which may be the same uh, organism, uh, could have a 40-foot wingspan. Um, but once again, just to, to wrap up, you know, we often ask, you know, could this evolve into this, etc. Well, pterosaurs clearly 
form a group because of all of their shared features. But if one compares one skull of a pterosaur to another, they are so different from each other. You know, some being clearly elongated and adapted for eating fish, others not. This one having a sieve-like set of, of teeth in its lower jaw, where it could perhaps scoop water out and, you know, and the water exits and it then, you know, has uh, captured uh, any larger animals um, uh, which uh, remain, uh, you know, but clearly uh, there's a great deal of variation uh, here, uh, and, you know, far greater variation here that would separate, for example, the dinosaur morphs from the first dinosaurs, or, uh, you know, the ancestral crocodiles uh, from uh, the later crocodiles, etc. So, um, the diapsid reptiles uh, produce not only a lineage known as the lepidosaurs, which would give us lizards, snakes, the tuatara, and other fossil lineages, but also the ruling reptiles. Now, the dinosaurs and birds are considered uh, in uh, future videos, um, but uh, there are a number of archosaur reptiles, especially in the Triassic period, when the archosaurs uh, evolved, um, and some survived. Uh, to produce not only the dinosaurs and birds, but also the crocodiles alive today, and pterosaurs, which were the first group of vertebrates to fly.